I give up. You guys are uh, that long. Long. Yeah, of course. There's There's three, right? right? Um, dire Straits. I'll do it better next time. <laughs> we give you a week to practice. There's dependency on Rob Tiffany. Um, I, I expect that he's going to sing with his velvety grunge voice and oh, he see? hasn't shown up. So my music. I'm, surp I'm surprised you haven't been sued yet, you know, for, you know, all this music that you make. Like there's, you know, so someone out there has to be ready to complain. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I have no, I have no response to that. Um, but hey, uh, we have a special guest. We have a special guest, and this week we're going to. Um, by the way, everyone, welcome to IoT Coffee Talk, and we have a special guest, Dimitri. You want to introduce yourself really quick to our audience? Yeah, I'm uh, so Dimitri. I'm uh, I work in tech. I'm a, I'm a data data platform guy. You know, started with uh, front office, back office, and then went to IoT. Uh, so uh, and actually, this is when I, I met with uh, Rob, who is uh, still is a, is a regular here. When he was at Itachi, I was at G Digital, and I worked mostly on uh, on digital twins. So and it's still a passion for me. So that's, uh, that's what yeah. I like to talk about. Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, we bump into you in Clubhouse all the time. That's I think where I met you first, right? Isn't that where we had our first conversation? It was around the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, exactly digital twins but more specifically digital twin applications right and um you know i think we kind of wanted to have this be sort of uh um you know a battle royale type of thing uh 2.0 piggybacking off of the the um the duel that um rob had with um aaron uh of um uh, of uh, clearblade a few weeks ago but um, I don't know where Rob is, but we're going to have a discussion about uh, uh, digital twins. And I know that you and I kind of have, uh, you know, different view on uh, digital twins, but I thought it would be fun to bring you in. And there's Rob. Speak of the devil. Now we are in trouble. Yeah, we're in yeah. big trouble. As usual. He's too, by the way. But... <laughs> hey. Is he, the, is he the normal Rob or we have a special Rob today? We it's a have... special Rob. Special Rob. A special Rob. With a Rob normal voice or a special What's voice? Up? I'm with a normal voice. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not the WWE voice, the wrestler voice. Not this time, brother. <laughs> <laughs> right oh on. So gosh. we're going to be talking about uh, digital twin applications, right? Cool. Yeah. Cool. And we yeah. have Dimitri on. Thank God. Kind of did his intro. Okay. Excellent. So we're ready now. We are ready. So let's dive in. Let's get into it. Actually, you know, today I had a conversation about what's the IoT killer application. So maybe we can start with what's the digital twin killer application. Yeah, sure. What do you think, Dimitri? Well, you know, I actually have, to some extent, I have similar view with, with Rob in the in the approach. Is you you have to start small, and uh, and I think that the biggest thing we could do is actually demystify, you know, what the, the digital twin is. And and I think I, uh, I I I said to you you guys, you know, before we started recording a little bit, my views has always been that uh, you know we've digitized you know, the business world, front office, back office, uh, and then we move on to communication engagement in the 90s and 2000s. Now we're starting to digitize the physical world. And the difference is that the thing is not going to disappear. You know, in the previous phases, we're virtualizing. So you're going to need a set of new technologies. So you're going to need a way to create what I actually more call like a digital artifact that is tightly connected and represent the physical thing. Yeah. So that's the idea. Now you can start extremely simple with that. It could be just, you know, basically monitoring operation parameters and have the documentation and the list of parts, you know, right. somewhere in that digital artifact. Right. So I guess, you know, my, my first thing is we should look at applications that are very simple. So, uh, and, and uh, um, Rob often used the, the car analogy. Uh, there's a very simple one that we had at, uh, at G when I worked there is uh, we, GE has those big trucks which has uh, electrical generators on top of them. And they worked with what's called a uh, Wokesha engine. 
So it's a big 16, 16 cylinder engine that actually you know, runs a uh, generators and produce electricity. And usually those things are deployed when you have, you know, either places where you need electricity <coughs> on the spot because you have a failure or you have a special event. Uh, we were running an event in a, on a pier in San Francisco and there was, you know, no real good infrastructure for electricity We bring that. Now, in this workage engine, there's a critical part. It's a spark plug. You know, you understand spark plug are very important on, uh, on, on, on engines, obviously. And uh, what we realize is that if the spark plug you know, fails, obviously your engine is shut down and it takes some time to fix the spark plug. And because it's a big engine, it could be complicated. So on top of the usual you know, control systems that exist for this engine to start it up, to see the performance, to see the power, we actually created a specific model that look at the current that goes into the spark plug and create what's called a lifing model. So we can have an estimation on how many hours remains on your spark plugs. Mm -hmm. And a very simple application, but we had those 16 spark plug. Okay, they can still have five days of life, and the event in three days, we're good. So, again, it's an example. You have an existing system which has its digital control. Now you make his digital twin smarter by adding this prediction on the spark plug. So, it's an example of a very simple application that doesn't require AR, VR, blockchain, <laughs> you know, 3D yeah. models and 5G and everything. Yeah. So, that's kind of the way I think about it. Dimitri, so are you saying that GE created Sparkplug as a service with NFT? <laughs> we, we could, actually. <laughs> we could. Uh, I'm not sure about the NFT thing, but uh, actually, it's a good idea. <laughs> because you can reset the Sparkplug, and actually, with the NFT, we'll be coding the reminding life on the Sparkplug. So why not? Let's, let's do that for Lamborghinis or, or Aston Martins. It would be more fun. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I want to remind everyone to not use any bad language, because apparently... Uh, all of the podcast platforms has, have rated the show explicit, meaning little kitties can't watch it. So watch the potty mouths, okay? Oh, Especially you, Rob. Goodbye, goodbye guys. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you rate that this is uh, that children can watch this? Why, why do you check that? You can check that children shouldn't watch this video. Oh, yeah. According yeah, we people. check it because we cuss on the show. We what say bad words. <laughs> we're inappropriate. Do they detect yeah, French we're, cursing? We're the gangster rap of IoT. That is what we yes. are. Yes. And we should be Insanity. proud of that. Yes. At least well, some people will be proud of that. I, I agree with that. With a lot of things you hear in this space, you, you need to curse, otherwise you get yes. crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Now that Dimitri's here, the shit just yeah. got real. Guys. Oh. Okay. See, we just... <laughs> hey, we just there, there it goes. Burned. The E, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> believe it, believe it. <laughs> Ain't nothing but a G thing, guys. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. It's a G thing, thing, not thing, baby. baby. Yeah. So a couple of things that I thought uh, were really important that surfaced from some of the conversations we've been in, right? And Dimitri, you actually been part of those conversations on Clubhouse. Uh, is uh, this idea of entanglement, or really having sort of this creating this mirror of a physical thing. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there saying, well, you don't need to have a f the physical thing to have a digital twin. I mean, I, you know, if you really look at the, the original definition of a digital twin, um, the answer to that question is yes, you do. Um, you know, you can have a digital twin prototype that may, might come out of a CAD model, but that's not actually the digital twin. The complicated stuff, uh, it is the implementation of a digital twin instance and making that stuff happen with all of the and, and supporting all the technical, the functional and non-functional requirements of uh, what that twin should do, which whether it's brokering data and make, having it translated so that it makes sense in the digital realm or uh, to provide some sort of low latency um, type um, mirroring of the state of that that uh, thing, the actual physical thing. So if you don't have the physical thing, uh, and, and and you have this digital thing, it's you know, it's not really a digital twin. Um, so I'll just throw that out there, um, and I know that's gonna that kind of runs counter to where digital th uh, twins have been going in terms of a term, but. 
No, I, I, I think you, you have an interesting point here, and I think we, we might have touched that on, on some of our clubhouse. Yeah. But uh, uh, we'll I actually bring it up here now. Yeah, I think that the, the original paper by Michael Greaves is, Greaves is actually, uh, first of all, it should be mandatory for everybody that even pronounced the word digital twin to read yeah. and to pass a test on it, because I bet you that most of the people don't. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the, the flow probably, and I actually had some email exchange with Michael on that because I, I had a couple of conversations with him. I think the flow is that, as you said, the term encompass too many things. Now, if you read the paper, what Michael explained, which is very important that most people don't understand, I believe, is the fact that you have to look at the whole life cycle of the physical thing, starting from ideation to creation, to design, to manufacturing, to operation, to decommission. And I would agree that before the thing exists, what he calls the digital twin prototype shouldn't probably call the digital twin. It should be more like a right. you know, digital model. And by the way, if you talk to a lot of people in the industry, the argument is say, oh, we've been doing that for 30 years. You know, I, I, I heard the guy from Mission saying we've been modeling tires for 30 years. And that's true. Now, what is different today is that the, the, the computing power or the, the resources we have is much better, so we can do much better models. So right. you have this sort of, you know, kind of digital model that you create first that can represent completely a future system with the intention to produce it. Now, when you start producing it, as we said, then you have this instance concept that is tightly connected to the physical thing. And Michael described that very well. What he also described well, which I find interesting, is that he talks about a digital twin environment, which is basically the place where the digital twin instances live, which is what we all call the platforms is, and what you, know, you, were, you were building Rob at Itachi, and I was trying to convince the G people to build. Mm -hmm. So again, all the concepts are here. And now, more importantly, in the, in the later part of the document, there's actually an explanation on how you use the digital twin. And the usage is that first you have a, what he calls, a, I think he used the term informative. So you can interrogate the twin. So where do you come from? Which digital model do you come from? What are your exact specification? So all the static parameters. Right. And then you have a predictive aspect because as you accumulate in the instance, the past data and the current data, you can of course do some pattern matching recognition using the aggregate of many twins and you can do predictions. So everything is in those seven pages if you read it closely enough and understand all the concept at the different phases. But again, you're right that the term creates a lot of confusion because some people use it before it exists, when it exists, after it exists, 3Ds, again, 5G, blockchain, NFTs, very, very, kind of buzzy so right so. right and, and but i think there are distinctions between models and digital twins and modeling ha is used before um maybe the quote-unquote digital twin is actually instantiated and then it can also be modeled uh from the data exhaust that comes off of a digital twin right and so one of the things that i noted was there is a distinction between the twin and the data, right? The data is not necessarily the twin. It can be fed back into characterizing, let's say, a model for a digital thing, which could then, uh, you know, characterize or even inform the data structure or schema for a digital twin. Uh, that's kind of how I read it and saw it. And I, I'm putting on my architect's hat. On, right because I, I used to have to do this all the time with my twin and my teams because I'd have technical folks from different camps come in and you know they would be using similar te uh, the same terminologies in entirely different ways right and so uh, you know my whole thing is I like to get to kind of clarity that makes uh, you know sense in the problem that we're trying to solve but one of the things that really kind of uh, jumped out at me in our conversations was when, uh, Rob, you brought up this whole thing about entanglement. And I think that's absolutely essential in helping people understand what is a digital twin beyond its applications and the use of its data. You don't have your architect hat on. You've got a Fender hat on. I do. Yeah. Yeah. But Rock you know what? Rolling. Leo Fender was the architect of music because the guitar is the foundation of rock and roll, baby. What, by the way, since I wasn't here, what song did you lead off with? Oh, I, I did a complete hack job, just disastrous uh, rendition of Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits. Oh. It was wow. 
bad. Wow. It totally sucked. You tried to play because that? You were, yes. <laughs> there you go. Yes. In, in, All right. in, fa in fairness, Knopfler is not the worst guitarist in the world. You know that is. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the bar is pretty high with him. <laughs> He's amazing. Oh my gosh. Oh my well, gosh. That's Leonard, so funny. You know, so you're, um, you know, back to your last comment. So you're, you're saying that data itself doesn't have a digital twin, but it's the conduit in which I use the data to create the twin because the twin of, of data is just called the backup copy for when we get hacked, we don't have to, you know, pay anyone in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, da da data is just data. I actually, actually disagree yeah. with that. No, uh, but it's oh, but again, yes. it's an interpret. It's it's yes. no, but it's but it's an interpretation of terms. It's an yep. interpretation of terms. What because, is a class? What is an object, yes. Leonard? Well, what because, is an asset? Data model. Yeah, no, well, it's methods, it's properties, and the data. Yeah. Well, there's three things. There's metadata, which to me is actually the the before it exists. Okay. Yeah. Then there is data, which is to me the, the the data is the foundation of the digital twin because again, my filter and that's my and actually you'll see uh, Leonard that your your views are pretty much aligned with what GE was thinking before I was there because GE was thinking that the the twin is really a model for them it was really a model in a pure sense of kind of you new know, AI or computing power. No, I, I, and, but, but that's not what I'm even. That's not what I'm saying. But keep going with yeah. your interpretation of what I said. Yeah. So, <laughs> so again, my, my interpretation goes back to I want to digitize that physical thing. So, hey, take like music. You know, you want to sample it, so you have a digital representation. Now, again, unlike music, the music is not going to disappear. Music, the, you know, the the thing is not going to disappear. In music, now you can say that music is purely digital, but you're going to have to sample. Now, you sample the the static properties. It's very simple. It's just one value, and actually, that value might be different from the metadata because you know very well that you said if it's ten centimeters, when you produce the part, it might be ten point zero two, and one might be might be nine point nine nine six. So you have the exact value. So you sample first the static values, and then because that system is instrumented with sensors and actuators, you also sample and get the data, and that the information model, which is first the metadata, the structure that comes from the the model before it exists. Then you have the behavior, which is the what you're sampling from the sensors. And actually, if you go to the next step, you also have the context. Where does it operate? Location, temperature, you know, actually what are the conditions, financial models, kind of things. So for me, the, the data layer is actually the first element of the twin. And once I have this data, I can do computing, I can do uh, analysis. I can look at the core of the of those different digital twins and do some pattern recognition and create a formula. That's so you construct on top of that. So I think data first, but again, that's my interpretation. But yeah. it goes away from the the kind of the model element. Yeah, no, I I don't see it that way. I see it as interface, the cyber physical interface first, because without that, you don't have the data. Um, and, you know, if you're using digital simulations to generate that data, okay, fine, but that's not, it's not solving the kind of problem that I think digital twins are intended to solve. But again, you know, I'm, I'm probably speaking, uh, I'm taking a heretical position, um, but I, what I want to do is, uh, you know, have people pressure test their, uh, their, um, uh, assumptions or notions about digital twins. Well, uh, now that we ever argue or, or disagree uh, in this form, but the, the I major don't mind be wrong, uh, by the way. I, I uh, don't mind being well, wrong. You're talking I, about a ghost inside a shell, dude. Yes. <laughs> but what Dimitri, you in in your in your view, though, so as it so as it relates to metadata, uh, would you, do you agree or disagree that depending on on the digital on the application of of a digital twin? that there are times where metadata is just as important in the recreation of the twin, or you think metadata, because it's, you know, it's pre-data, I think it's what you called it, it's not really, it's not really know. necessary. Okay, what, number what's one, your view? You know, no, 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 no. What the, the hell is metadata? You know, what is metadata? It's well, data it, 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 you, about it, abstract. data. Like, you it, know, so, no, you know, I would think, you know, like, like noise, uh, you know, other, so yeah. in, oh, my interpretation would be, so if I'm thinking digital twin of, of the, of the GE generator that Dimitri was uh, describing, right? He's got all this data, all the specs down to the, down to the spark plug. So metadata for me would be what's the environment in which this thing is operating indoors, outdoors, 
Uh, and I, Mark is disagreeing. So, the, so it does it matter or not? Yeah. So, no, it, it it does matter, but it matters more from the standpoint of defining the the data model or the schema. That's what the metadata is. Then you have data. And so what the metadata does is it provides um, structure around, especially all this unstructured shit. Okay, so we have to earn the E, right? We have to earn the E. Earn it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got all this unstructured shit out here. You, you, the, the, it gets tagged with the metadata so that we understand what that bit and byte means uh, in the application, right? And that yeah, totally. That, that, that's what met, and, and you know that term has been so misused in the media. I think it's twisted our understanding of what metadata really is. Exactly. And some people think that it's actually the data. And it's like no, it's not the data. And when you start thinking about it in terms of content, yes, it starts to mean something else. But you have to be very savvy in understanding the definition of metadata to kind of cross that bridge. And that's where things get completely confused. I, I give you a, that chasm. Yeah, I, I give you a simple analogy because again, I, I, I stick to my uh, to my entry point: digitization. Yeah. Okay, think about SQL. SQL uh -huh. has two things. SQL is a DDL, DDL the data description language, yep. which is the, the data model. So you, you, you're, you're, you're building an invoicing system. You define what is an invoice. You define what is a customer. And you define that the fact that the customer places an invoice. So you have a language to describe that. Then you create records, which are actually the instances related to those metadata. So this is, and again, we're over, we overcomplicating that thing. It is not that complicated. It is, it is kind of simple. I mean, structure, behavior, context, okay? And actually context is data to me, it's not metadata. Now, you need to model the context. I mean, if you're modeling a building, you're modeling the atmosphere, you need a, meta, you need a data model for that. So that's the way. Now, Leonardo, I, I want to go- I stand corrected. No, look, yeah. I'll, probably, I'll, I'll stand corrected because th this yeah. this is, you know, we get wrapped in, in, in semantics, but, the in in my in my head, which is mostly empty, uh, not only on the outside but on the inside. Oh, there he goes again. You know, I always have this idea that you know we talk about digital twins, and I have two assets that are identical, but I ship one to the Arctic, and I ship another one to the you know to the middle of the desert in, in Arizona, and I ex and of course they don't work uh, the same. But to your point, you know, is is context, environmental context, not necessarily metadata so i hereby announce i will never use metadata in the wrong way like i have and it's okay no you're and, not you're not a problem, like, no, you're problem. Not this is why people one, should sign David. up and listen to us you're not exactly. you're not the only one you're not the only one so don't don't feel bad i mean oh I, but i admit it <laughs> but no, no, rob, I, I, rob has a stink face so he he must think that so much of what we're saying is absolutely yes. wrong <laughs> yeah we, i think we, I think because Dimitri is a teapot. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> well, it no, it's ex ex excellent, excellent liaison, Rob, because you know, I want to go back to what you're saying, Leonard, because I think it's very interesting. And, and uh, you know, the funny thing, guys, with all those discussions I have is uh, usually I, I actually agree with everybody because I think that everybody brings a good uh, angle is the organization of everything that is poorly done. And that's usually what I'm good at. Because what you were going, Leonard, is actually very related to what Rob was saying. What I think is missing in this whole discussion about digital twin is an interaction protocol. Because if you assume that you've digitized, let's, let's assume five seconds we've digitized all those physical objects. You know, it's it's digital twin, it's, it's models, whatever it is. Now, if we want to create value, we need to be able to, again, discover them. So I want to go on a network and say, oh, what's on my network? Oh, there are 42 teapots and there are 65 coffee pots. Now, coffee pot number 63, uh, what model are you? Oh, I have this power, this capacity. Oh, great. What is your current status? Oh, I'm just brewing coffee. Oh, what's going to happen? Oh, by the way, tomorrow my burner is going to blow up because my fuse is old or whatever. So we are going to elevate the discussion, and which is what this HTCPCP protocol was about, which if you guys don't know is a joke that is on the internet. Uh, and I can tell you a little more about it if you want. But it's my point is that we, and that's why I get so frustrated with those industry 4.0 discussion on how to actually implement digital twin and what standard we should use for time series and should we convert the bytes into your know, big Indian or little Indian. 
doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I want to talk to the coffee pot and say, what can you do? How many cups can you do per day? For how long before you need maintenance? Mm -hmm. So we need to elevate. So again, you have a great point. The digital twin doesn't solve the problem of interoperability and and, and protocol between the physical objects. But that's to me where the interesting problem is. Select cups from coffee pot where coffee pot ID equals 62. Yeah. No, 42. Exactly. Something like that. I'm really glad to just hear you talk about DML and DDL and the data, because that's how I do, you know, I didn't read Michael Greaves stuff at the beginning like you did when I started going down this path. I, I approached it. I thought I was a data scientist for years until I found out that I wasn't. I'm a select star scientist, as it turns out. I thought I thought being an expert at SQL, I thought someone who actually worked on Microsoft SQL Server made me a data scientist guy, but apparently I have to be like- You stole it from Sybase. I know, I know, I know, yep. I was there. It, it turns out you have to be a R or Python person to be a true data scientist, which is total yeah. bullshit. We're getting the E for explicit again. Wait. But but when I so when I built my digital twin stuff, I thought about it as a base class, and I thought the instance is the the object. And what is an object? Its methods, its properties, and it is the data all together. And without all of it together, there's you don't get the value. The value is when you have all of it together. Just like your great illustration, Dimitri data manipulation language in SQL Server, Oracle, whatever, in SQL, mm. without having to use a graph database, Rick, oh. Bolotta, um, <clears throat> you know, you define the data model and the attributes. What is that? Those are properties or I think that's metadata. Yeah. And that's the shell, the yeah. ghost without the shell, right? Mm. And, then the, and then you have the instance of it, you know, data flows into it. I add rows and columns into that schema. And then I query it to find out. And that's how I derive value. It's that simple, folks. P- please don't overthink this stuff. Please, please, please don't overthink that stuff. Um, what is Tupac's hologram? Is it a digital twin of Tupac? Or is it just an empty shell? What do y'all it's think? An, it's an empty shell. <laughs> it's I not him. <laughs> Well, that model, you know, you know, he will be, uh, he will be 50 years old. Uh, really? Yes. Or, or today. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think that's also, the, that's another dimension of confusion. I, I believe in this space is the fact that, and this is what I saw that very clearly at G is that because we see the concept through his, uh, it's graphical representation. Uh-huh. We actually imprison the data value inside the application. So that's why I'm, I'm an extremely, uh, 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 I would say, uh, uh, picky, or I don't find the, the English word right now. So, so I'm very, uh, uh, I'm, I'm fighting very hard when people say, "Oh, the application is this 3D model." No, the 3D model is, a, I mean, the graphical model is a representation, but it should be loosely coupled to the digital twin that provides the data and information. Because if, because what we, what happened at G was really kid me. Is that you? Know, every time we, that's why I sometimes say, guys, we have to stop talking about Internet of Things. There is no Internet of Things. The things don't materialize. There is an Internet of Sensor. Every time you want a new outcome, you go back, oh, I want this outcome. I go back to the data, I go back to the sensor, I write an application. And I want a second outcome, I go back to the sensor again. And I go back to the sensor again. So we're building all those silos that all talk to the sensors as opposed to create this abstract digital artifact that represent the physical thing and have multiple applications talking to it. One could be a VR lens, solo lens, yeah. whatever. One could be a blockchain that I want to trace every time there's a change. One could be a 5G that broadcasts that to the world. But yeah. there is this artifact. You know? And the first thing is that you know, we've done that in back office application. We yeah. tried to do EDI in the 90s. We tried to exchange yeah. data bits, and then we created web services, yeah. and we created a protocol. And now if you want to pay by credit card, you just send the credit card number and the amount. Yeah. You don't figure out how it is stored. Anyway. Sensors are things. There's always okay. a yeah, they are. Sensors are things. Sensors there's, are always a, there's always a smart ass in the, in the, in the yeah. audience. Oh, no. He's the biggest smart ass. Soylent Green oh, is no, people. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's that guy that spot the little mistake in the spreadsheet that ruined your whole presentation because you have one little comma missing somewhere. 
No, yeah. but you have a point. But you, I think you see what I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, Dimitri, I really like where you're going with this because I think you know we have to take a step back with IoT and really figure out what it means. It, it, uh, it, it's you know we've mentioned this several times on our show. It's it's just a term that gets immensely overloaded. But yeah, it, it it's basically that cyber physical interface. How do you, how do you, and the sensors are the key part of it, right? I mean, they, they're, the, they're the feelers. It, I mean, sensors are the things that translate physical things uh, that, uh, well, they sense stuff. It's like our sensory system. Yeah. But, you need actuators as well. Yeah, and, and you know what, That all that stuff is hard enough. And when you start thinking about analytics, AI, all this other stuff, those can enhance some of the functions uh that and you know help solve some of the problems we're trying to do just in the iot but then there's all the stuff that you can do with the data that comes off of it that i don't necessarily i mean we like to associate it with iot but i think of it more of iot plus ba you know bi analytics and all the other crap that you can do to build applications that um you know are more meaningful to uh, people who have dinero, right? A lot of the IoT stuff, it's like the pipes. Like Rob, you always say, you know, this is all about, you know, the pipe, right? You're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. It's that simple. It's when you start to, you know, extend this into like friggin' weird psychophysical or metaphysical ontology stuff and concepts, then you, you really confuse everyone. It's a and big then word. you lose the focus on what IoT really is. I don't but know. But let me let me disagree a bit on, on this yes. discourse because I, I, I don't Please. agree hundred percent. So so first of all, um, sensors are things, well yeah, there are things that have multiple sensors, right? So how, how do you call that? Uh, on the other hand, yeah, that's that's okay that a uh, device can have yeah, a device can have multiple things, but yeah, what you say that building these pipes that gets data from this sensor and from the other sensor, it's hard. It's not easy. And it's not, oh, yeah. oh man, I forgot to put an, a temperature sensor here. Well, let's, let's put another sensor and create the pipe. Yeah, well, that's not that simple. Make hardware, it's super complicated. Certify it, uh, introduce it into the place. So, so there is this lack of part of from the data or from this pipe yeah no fr yeah from the data or from the bi or from the iot platforms to the to the real wall that's the hard part from my from my point uh, so, what are you what are you disagreeing with i think that's at least that's what we're kind of moving toward in this conversation it, that is the hard part and why don't we focus on solving that problem and figuring out how to manage, maintain, and orchestrate, or maintain and cor correlate, or even relate digital twins, uh, than sitting there, you know, starting to talk about how you know we need to layer on metaphysical stuff. You guys know? Do you know guys know a guy named Bruce Sinclair? Mm -hmm. He's down in the valley. I've been listening to his podcast for years on IoT, and he's created courses to teach you yeah. and train you on IoT. And he used to struggle with the term digital twin. He didn't like it either. And he called it a software defined product. Um, he would have he would have digital twin experts from GE and others on his show. And he would battle back and forth with them. He's just like, it's just a software. And what is a software defined product? It's metadata and the data and blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's one aspect of it again, but I think that the, the other the other dimension I, I like to throw is uh, the, the way I try to communicate because I think it's, it it answers some of your 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 concern here, Mark. Is uh, when you think about you know using building digital twin, you actually have three things: you have build, run, consume. Okay, and the three things are hard. Building so again by digital twin, I mean building that digital artifact that can represent a physical system to a certain level of fidelity. And by the way, I think there's a whole discussion on fidelity because if I go back, just quick parenthesis, if I go back to the analogy of music, in music there is math that demonstrates which sampling frequency you should have to have perfect reconstruction of the music. That's a whole other debate about that. But so building that digital representation, and again, it can be as simple as for this specific asset, all I want to know is when the spark plug are going to fail, that the business need. So you build that. Then you need the place where those things are and those things can be found. And actually, that's also a problem that is not, I don't see anybody solving that very well. When I first worked at GSA, where's the catalog of assets? 
But I can see that also the assets that we had. Actually, you had something better, I believe, at Itachi, Rob, but we didn't have that at G. All the, the assets were hidden in the applications. Okay? And then you have what we were discussing, you know, which is the consume. Now that I have that digital artifact, I need the separation of duty so that I don't need to be a microservice aware NFT Java developer to be able to get value out of the digital artifact. I want a very simple language to query it. To, uh. So if you think about those three phases, they're all difficult, but it's the separation, I believe, which is really important that we don't do. We say, oh, yeah, it's a digital tool application, and everything in bundle is one, and it's extremely complicated. So if you separate who builds it, who is usually the person that created the thing, you know, it has to run on the platform. And by the way, this platform to me will be a Microsoft and AWS. It will never be an industrial player. And then how do you consume it, which is I need a protocol to talk to those things. Mm -hmm. So it's another way to think about it that, to me, simplifies a little bit. Um, I like it. I like it. Um, so where's go. the killer? So where's the killer app to Mark's uh, question thirty-seven minutes ago? Now that I'm keeping track, what's the killer <laughs> app for digital twin? Like, what's what's the most half? Or what's like the I mean, most value? Does the concept of killer app still exist? I think the value should be, as you said, the value should be driven from you know the the and and actually you know. It's interesting you say that because in another discussion I was you know, having endless time at GE is that I think there are two classes of problems that you can solve with digitization of the physical world. The first one is optimization. So there are a lot of businesses like uh, oil and gas mining, which are not being disrupted by technology. At the end of the day, we're still extracting resources from the freaking planet. Okay? Now, can we do it better and save billion? Yes. And that's where, you know, you should have digital twin, you know, value, like, you know, I'm using uh, an excavator to dig the earth and this excavator randomly fails when it's in the uh, no Northern Pacific and it's less fail when it's in the desert. So understand that and predict your failure is one element. So you have a whole set of class of problem, which are really around how can I optimize and optimizing is usually fairly simple. You want to understand how your thing works individually. You want to predict when they're going to break. So you can said thing them. works. Yeah. yeah, things works, exactly. <laughs> and then you orchestrate the whole for optimization. So that's one class. Then you have another where there are disruption. Now, for example, in power, you have disruption because it used to be the big nuclear power plant that we crank up the power distributed to a grid. And now it's a bunch of little producers with renewables and batteries and their fluids. So, so there you can have event new model and disrupt. So I think that's the filter you have to have, but you have to start with a business problem. Am I trying to optimize that? Am I trying to put BGE out because they're a bunch of idiots? I want to replace that with Teslas and batteries. Yeah, and then you build the technology that you need for that. It's not the other way around. So this whole debate about the digital twin should be a very high fidelity representation of all the exact characteristic of the thing. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. they just need to give you what you need to use it better. <laughs> I mean, I, again, it's. I, I tend to oversimplify, but we have to push people to simplify. It's not that complicated. I mean, you know, it used to be extremely complicated to do a credit card transaction on the internet. You had to buy a MasterCard modem, use their protocol, use serial ports. Now you go on the web and you just send the metadata, the data, knowing the metadata they want, and it tells you authorize, decline, you get the money in two days. Simple. Yeah, simple is good. Well, remember where you heard it first, folks. IoT coffee talk. That was uh, that was a yeah. gem, Dimitri. That was good. Yeah, I like that. He's been getting a lot of practice. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, spending yeah, a hell of a lot of time on uh, Clubhouse. I always see the little thing, you know, notification <laughs> pop up that says Dimitri is on talking about IoT digital twin. <laughs> yeah, I'm tr I'm trying to mo I'm trying to market myself. I'm not that good actually at that. So that's that's actually, actually I have to yeah, fix. That. So you're doing digital yeah. twins in French now on. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to try that in 40 minutes here. I don't know who's okay. going to show up, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you're going to start it's an experiment. talking about wine instead. It's an, it's an experiment. So, oh, I'm sure people will tell me they've been modeling how to make wine for decades, and I'm an idiot. But uh... <laughs> Yes, I've been in that house of digital twins, and it's in German when I go on there sometimes. Yeah, that's that's okay. I mean, I, I met uh, I think Christina runs this, and and she runs it in uh, in German, in Italian. I say, hey, I'm French. Maybe I'll try to do it in French. See, yeah. you know, contribute a little back to the community, and, uh, and yeah, uh, totally. it'll be fun. No, that's good. Wow, uh, Mark could do it in Spanish. We're, we're like the United Nations here. Pretty much. Good. Right. Oh, well, we should. I mean, if you're interested, let me know. I, I, I'm I, from Atlantis. <laughs> Atlantis. So. Actually, I can think of a I can think of a killer app, but 
Say it. Drop it, brother. Uh, yeah, no, then, say then it. We, we would get an X rating. So. <laughs> Oh. Don't say it then. Yeah. Oh, this this one just get an E rating. We, it would be an X rating. So well, these, no, these things exist. These it. things these things exist already, and then being hacked, which is the fun thing to do. <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah, because the security is crap. Yeah, I mean, security I don't is know crap. Where his head's at. <laughs> Could we be? Well, let's let's talk about that because I'm trying to do a little bit of this. Can we? But I'd love your perspective. Can we be using concepts around digital twins to help us with security? whether it's what? securing IoT stuff, securing whatever. Is there something to be learned from that that could help us with security? Well, I think that the, well, there was actually, I haven't, I haven't spoken with uh, anyone since then, but there was uh, some people working on the concept of digital ghost when I was at GE. And you, if you think about it, the, the way we do, uh, the way we do actually, uh, the way actually, because the, there's another, I mean, put my thought together. Okay, there's another dimension, so I know I'm giving many dimensions, is actually the machine element. So I think there's an evolution. And I, when I was at GE, I had this, this idea of a machine 5.0, you know, because it's better than industry 4.0, you know, industry 4.0, machine 5.0. Okay. So if you look at the way uh, machines are set of evolved, you know, beginning there was no instrument, then there was analog, then we started with basic computer, then we went into uh, this basic computer and HMI and Scala, and then finally we got into, uh, into the using this data to create analytics. But what has really changed recently is the ability to, beyond just the cyber physical, which is the physical thing, the sensor and the control system, we can add more computing power, like an edge. And this edge, to me, should be the gateway to the digital twin. It should basically protect and the data and, 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 and actually manage who can access it and who can get the data. So my answer to you, Rob, is probably by adding more compute power on those things and creating a proper shield we might have some good answers to physical security, to security through physical security. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know my theory on that, the, the foundational element, the network, the internet, the road is crap. So it's totally insecure. So you, have, you cannot secure the network unless we redesign it, which we might do one day. OK, so you have to work, you know, on the edges of the system. So maybe the answer is there, add more compute power and have a sort of you know, digital ghost that actually looks at the request at what's happening, how it operates and, 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 and protects the thing. So that might be a dimension to think about. Uh, you, you heard my feelings, Dimitri, with something you said. So can I convince you to rephrase that there are portions of the network that we could argue and validate that they are secure? I think what you meant to say is that end to end, there might be there might be holes in the network, but there's tons of ways to secure segments of a network between point A and point B. Or, or do you or are you saying that you know all networks? No, because secure. anybody can go on this network and look at the traffic. There is no enforced authentication and authorization on this network. So you can secure end to end whatever you want. Somebody will always be able to look at your encrypted traffic. Now, yes, it's encrypted, but can that person then go and manipulate some of your endpoint to decrypt it? Can that person find a, uh, a backdoor or a zero day in your encryption so that it has your encryption traffic and decrypt it? So until we have authentication and attribution fundamentally deeply rooted in the network, it's never going to happen. And what is fascinating is that the network operators have kind of solved that now. The SIM cards are not, and, and Rob can probably tell more than that than I, the SIM cards are not kind of completely perfect, but they're close enough. So yeah. the network operators have actually the way they instrument the network and manage the network, find that solution. On the internet, we decided not to do that because, and, and I mean, it was created by you know, idealistic people that just wanted to share things and they had no concept of that. Now, the drama is with we've put you know, critical businesses and now we put a critical infrastructure. And by the way, Rob, I'm reading the same book you mentioned last week from this journalist from the New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. Scary shit. Thank you for making my sleep even worse than it is usually. Uh, and and I, I, I thought I thought of everything, but I didn't, apparently. It's terrifying. Yeah. What's the book? God. This is uh, how they tell me the world is going to end. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's it's about security. It's already in game, dude. Yeah. It's bad. It, people need to wake up. We have people so, sleepwalking on yeah. the internet. They don't realize they're walking on an active battlefield. Yeah, they don't realize the bad guys are what already the in our. Huh. No, it was this was the episode when you went really dark on us, right? You went like, yeah, maybe so. Yeah, yeah. which one? 
Yeah, which it was one? actually awesome. Yeah. Which one? But yeah, it's a, you should read it. It's good to read. It's good to hear from a lay person, a layman's view of what's really going on in security rather than a technical person because it, yeah. it makes it more real. Um, totally. Yeah. So we, we can secure some things, but you know, fundamentally, there's a, that's why I keep on believing that at some point, uh, and I think I use this analogy, I mean, we've let the US infrastructure, and actually not just in the US everywhere, you know, the roads, the bridges, you know, 40, like they were 40 years ago, and they are decaying. So now there's a big effort, a trillion dollars put in by the administration to fix that. I think we're going to have to do that at some point yeah. on our network. And, and we probably need to end up with the, the usual analogy, which is when, when you go to a hacker conference, like they've gone, and, and some of you might have gone there, usually you have two networks. You have one, one uh, access point, one network where you need X509 certificates. There's no peer-to-peer. -peer. It's kind of robust. It's not perfect. It's kind of robust. And then you have another network, which is everything's open, peer-to-peer, -peer, you do whatever you want. And depending on what use case, you know, you're a whistleblower, you go on the free completely open network and you shout. Yeah. You're doing with critical infrastructure. You don't go on this one. You're forced to go to the other one, which is... Arden, we're going to have to get into those kind of solutions, I believe. So. Yeah, yeah. That, that whole zero, uh, zero, zero trust day stuff. and zero trust. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can't secure the network, but you can protect things on the network. And I think that's the distinction people need to understand. And that comes straight from John Kindervog, the guy who, who uh, created the buzzword. That actually but you, but you're, still dependent, you're still dependent on your endpoints being absolutely totally secure and have no zero days. Because again, if I can get on the network and listen to your traffic, yeah. and if I can find a zero day in your endpoint, yeah. you might have a problem. So fundamentally, it's fundamentally, there's a problem there. If I'm not allowed on the network, unless I'm authenticated, yeah. it's different. Yeah. So that's why I think there is also, but I agree, we can, you can do a lot with zero trust, you know, and if you, yeah. I mean, it also depends how big of, it's always the same thing. It depends how big of a target you are. You know, if you put nation state power, you can do whatever you want to secure. You will be corrupted. You will be breached. Yeah. It will happen. Yeah. I mean, and that's why it's all about protecting things, um, you know, and, and that that's a different mindset than securing. But uh, yeah. Hey, we got to wrap it up. Right. I got a yeah. jam. Yeah. So, yeah. hey, Dimitri, awesome having you. Who wants to take us out? Mark. Mark. Yeah. You've never done it before. Oh, taking so out. You have to take us out. Take, take, take us out of the episode. Thanks so much for inviting me, guys. It was super cool. I, I love the stuff. So, yeah, no, it's great having thanks you. Thanks for coming here. Man. Yeah, thanks for coming. Subscribe here. And um, see you next week. Yeah. IOTCoffeeTalk.com, people. www.iotcoffeetalk.com. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks, guys. We're on hey, Spotify. Guys. Yeah, we're good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Explicit. We're explicit Ridiculous. on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Let's, yeah, let's do weird. NFTs. Let's do NFTs. NFT. And we got NFTs on Stitcher. Yeah. <laughs> Blue Ocean. Uh, OpenSea. OpenSea. Yes. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.